A common belief is the doctrine of the Trinity is a total Christian invention. Before the rise of Christianity, early Jews never thought of or considered the idea of a multi-personal God and only thought of the unified single figure. Christians either made up the Trinity to explain how Jesus revealed himself or they stole it from paganism. But this is simply not true. And if you study early Jewish writings, you will see that many authors wrestled with the idea of three powers in the Old Testament who all seemed to be God. The Trinity doctrine was not an invention of the New Testament, but was taught overwhelmingly throughout the Old Testament as well. Many ancient Jews and Jewish scholars today have recognized this, like Jewish scholar Benjamin Sommer. This is actually an old ancient Near Eastern idea that is an old Semitic idea that is popping up again among those Jews who were the founders of Christianity. And we Jews have always tended to sort of make fun of the Trinity. Oh, how can there be three that is one? Really, really they're pagans. They're not real monotheists like we Jews are or like the Muslims are. Those Christians are really pagan. But I think that what we're seeing from what I've been saying uh, in the past couple days is that, you know, the idea of the Trinity, that there is this one God who manifests itself in three different ways, that's actually an old ancient Near Eastern idea that can function in a monotheistic context, um, as it does, I think, in the J and the E texts and some of the other texts that we were looking at. In fact, to say that three is one, heck, the Kabbalah is going to go further than that. They say ten is one, and actually when you get to Luriana Kabbalah, and there's the idea that within each of the Sefirot, each of the ten Sefirot has ten Sefirot within it, so that we've got a hundred different Sefirot, really. We're taking this reasoning much, much farther than the Christians did. So actually, one of the more radical conclusions that I came to, much to my own surprise, when I was writing this book, and this is not at all what I had intended to do, because in various ways that we could discuss if you're interested, I'm actually rather uncomfortable with my own conclusion here, but as a scholar, I got to call him as I see him. Um, one of the conclusions that I came to, to my shock when I finished this book, is that we Jews have no theological objection to the doctrine of the Trinity. I came to the conclusion that we Jews have no theological right to object to the Trinity. Theologically, I think that the model of the Trinity is an old ancient Near Eastern idea that shows up in the Tanakh and that in a different way shows up in Jewish mysticism as well. As Dr. Summer points out, there are clear passages in the Old Testament where there are different persons or powers of God who are distinct, yet still the one God. Early Jews also recognized this nature about God and wrote concerning it. To be fair, not all of them interpreted these passages the same way a Christian Trinitarian does. But they do recognize the existence of other powers alongside God and multiple powers that are all God. For example, in the Talmud, there is a passage where the author is debating with a Jewish Christian who pointed to Exodus 24.1, where God says to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. The Jewish Christian was arguing, It is odd that God said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, instead of come up to me. And it is likely there were different persons of one God. Now the rabbi in response could have just said that the usage is not unusual, but the rabbi instead replies that God was actually speaking of a different power in heaven, namely the Metatron, the highest of all angels, who also had the same name as God. So the early rabbis recognized the Torah taught there were different figures, all called the Lord. This correlates to what we said, that there was a divine figure who is also the Lord, known as the angel of the Lord. People often say, we well, must just be a created being because he is an angel. But remember, the word angel in Hebrew just means messenger, not a divine figure. Human messengers were called angels in Genesis. To be an angel just meant you were a messenger. So calling this figure the angel of the Lord doesn't mean he is also one of the created angels as we know them, just a messenger from the Lord, who is also called the Lord. Jewish scholar Nahum Sarna recognizes this and says, from several texts, it is clear that the demarcation between God and his angel is often blurred. At the exodus from Egypt, it is now God, now his angel, who goes ahead of the Israelite camp. Another interesting thing that the Jewish Targums do is distinctly say someone known as the Memra of the Lord is a distinct figure from the Lord, but who also has the same attributes as the Lord. Dr. Michael Brown says, Since God was often perceived as somehow untouchable, it was necessary to provide some kind of link between the Lord and his earthly creation. One of the important links in rabbinic thought was the word, called Memra in Aramaic. We find the Memra concept hundreds of times in the Aramaic Targums. This helpful chart shows how often the early Jewish Targums 
would translate passages from scripture that applied to God to say it was the divine figure known as the Memra, or Word of the Lord, acting as God. The Word created man, and is quite often equated with God during covenants and giving commandments. When the Old Testament says God did or said something, the early Jews translated this in Aramaic to mean it was the figure known as the Word of the Lord who actually did and said these things. Since God was untouchable, the spoken Word of God came to us and did these things. Who in a sense would have been an extension of God? And this itself would not have been foreign to early Jews, because the early rabbis spoke much about the Shekinah, the divine presence of God on earth, and it oftentimes is described as the motherly aspects of God. Being the divine approachable presence of God on earth is also the same concept we see in the Memra or Angel of the Lord. Now what is interesting is several early rabbis talk about the Shekinah as being a divine extension. As Dr. Michael Brown says, in fact, Rabbi Akiva went as far as saying that according to the scriptures, when God redeemed his people, he had, as it were, redeemed himself. Some Hasidic Jews, joining the concept of the Shekinah with the mystical concept of the Sphira, took this one step further. They believed and still believe that the purpose of the performance of the mitzvah is to help the Shekinah to unite with the Tefirat, the male principle. The sins of Israel hinder this union and prevent the reunification of worlds. The Hasidim, in accordance with this belief, adopted the formula, much deplored by their opponents, for the sake of the unification of the Holy One, blessed be He and His Shekinah. Now this belief is not explicit in the Bible. It is an interpretation of the rabbis trying to wrestle with the fact that the Old Testament teaches multiple divine figures that are all somehow the Lord. On top of this, besides the angel or the word of the Lord, early Jews also recognized the existence of someone known as the Holy Spirit interceding between the Lord and Israel. Dr. Michael Brown says, Lamentations Rabbah 360 and 9 relates that after the Roman Emperor Hadrian indiscriminately executed two Jews, the Holy Spirit kept crying out, You have seen, O Lord, the wrong done to me. Uphold my cause. You have seen the depth of their vengeance, all their plots against me. This provides an example of the Spirit making intercession. According to Leviticus Rabbah, the Holy Spirit is a defense counsel who speaks to Israel on behalf of the Lord and then speaks to the Lord on behalf of Israel. In all these citations, which can be easily multiplied, there can be no question that we are dealing with a who and not just a what, with a personal dimension of God and not just with an impersonal power, with God himself and yet with a separate entity who can mediate between God and man. And these citations closely parallel some of the New Testament descriptions of the Holy Spirit, although virtually all the rabbinic texts cited were written many years later. The early Jewish writer known as Philo also recognized a holy trinity of divine figures in the Old Testament. However, his belief was not identical to Trinitarianism. It was more like semi-Arianism, believing God created the Logos, or Word, and the Holy Spirit to be the other divine powers with him, yet made out of his own essence. But unlike modern Jews, he also says that there were three divine figures in the Old Testament who do things only God can do. God created through his Word, or as he referred to him as the Logos, and his Holy Spirit. For Philo, the Logos was the firstborn, governor and administrator of all things, high priest of this world, God's son, and who Adam was made in the image of. Philo may even have suggested the Messiah would be the divine incarnation of the Logos and not a mere man. Behold, a man whose name is the East, a very novel appellation indeed, if you consider it as spoken of a man who is compounded of body and soul, but if you look upon it as applied to that incorporeal being who in no respect differs from the divine image. You will then agree that the name of the East has been given to him with great felicity, for the Father of the universe has caused him to spring up as the eldest son, whom in another passage he calls the firstborn, and he who is thus born, imitating the ways of his father, has formed such and such species, looking to his archetypal patterns. Connecting the firstborn or divine image, who Philo says is the Logos, to Zechariah 6.12, would be to say that the Logos is the Messiah, since this passage is a messianic prophecy, which is exactly the same belief that Christians were taught by Jesus. For Philo, the Holy Spirit was also similar to what is taught in Christianity. Philo often referred to him as the divine spirit, and people would be possessed by the Holy Spirit to do God's will. The Spirit would also be breathed upon people and lead people to seek God and worship him. Philo's idea was very similar to what Christians also taught about the nature of God, and both found these things while studying the Jewish scriptures. So the claim the Trinity was solely a Christian invention is unfounded. 
Many early and modern Jews have wrestled with the fact that the scriptures teach there is only one God, but there are three distinct figures who all seem to be God. Thus we can see the Trinity came out of the Jewish scriptures. It was not something stolen from paganism or made up by Christians, but revealed from what Jesus taught of himself and what the Jewish scriptures had already established.